committee will now come to order. We will start our second panel with a note that by mutual agreement um, we are told that the TSA will show up at 12.15. So we are going to try to have a third panel at 12.15. Nevertheless, we want to start with the second panel. We appreciate all of you gentlemen for being here this day. Let me do some brief introductions uh, and then swear you in, and then we will go to the five-minute opening statements. Mr. Mark Rotenberg is the Executive Director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, often known as EPIC. Dr. David Brenner is a Higgins Professor of Radiation Biophysics and the Director of Radiological Research at Columbia University. Mr. Fred Cote, or Kate sorry, is a Senior Policy Advisor with the Center for Information Policy Leadership at Hunton and Williams. Hunton and Williams. And Mr. Stuart Baker is a partner with the law firm of Steptoe and Johnson LLP. We appreciate all of you gentlemen being here with us uh, today. We appreciate your credentials and, and look forward to your testimony. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. We will now start with opening testimonies. We would appreciate if you would limit your comments to, um, to five minutes, but your entire written statement will be made part of the record. We will start with Mr. Rotenberg. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to appear today before you. I also wanted to thank you personally for the leadership uh, that you have shown on this particular issue, which is of great concern to the American public. I also want to begin by saying that EPIC fully appreciates the important mission that the TSA has and the importance of protecting aviation security. There is no dispute about that today. What I would like to do is describe for the committee the work that we have pursued over the last five years concerning a particular airport screening technology that the TSA has adopted and now hopes to widely deploy in U.S. airports, and that is the body scanner technology. We became aware of this technology almost six years ago. We followed at the very beginning uh, the concerns that had been raised about the privacy impact, about the health impacts, and also whether the technology would be effective. We were very cautious at the outset. We wouldn't uh, make any strong statements until we had obtained more facts to understand how the technology would be used. So we began a series of Freedom of Information Act requests. We were trying to understand the technical specifications, the protocols, the contracts that had been arranged with the vendors. We also began to work with um, expert organizations, civil rights groups, groups across the political spectrum, uh, groups that represent uh, passengers, groups in the travel industry. And as we became aware of the concerns that had been raised, uh, we, we joined with these organizations and submitted a, a petition uh, to Secretary Napolitano in the spring of 2009, shortly after we learned of the, the TSA's plan to make these uh, body scanners the primary screening technique in U.S. airports. This seemed to us to be a sharp uh, departure from what the agency had previously said about the use of this technology. And so 30 organizations uh, wrote to the Secretary in the spring of 2009 and respectfully asked her to conduct a public rulemaking so that there would be an opportunity for the public to express its views uh, on the TSA's program and so the TSA's decision on those comments would ultimately be subject to some type of judicial review. We also in that petition urged her to suspend uh, further deployment of the technology uh, for primary screening uh, because we felt the case had not yet been made that they were uh, sufficiently tested. And I will say, uh, Mr. Chairman, it was around this time as well that your bill, uh, which you introduced in the House, passed through the House with more than 300 votes, uh, which was essentially trying to drive the agency back to the same position to keep these devices for secondary screening where they might be used for special cases. Now, the story actually gets quite a bit more interesting because in January of 2010, we obtained the first set of documents that we had requested under the Freedom of Information Act. And I have attached to my testimony just a couple of pages. We actually have thousands of pages 
uh, that roughly fall into two categories. The first category is the description of the devices, and the second category is the many traveler complaints that the agency uh, has received. Now, the description of the devices, and now we are talking about the procurement specifications and the vendor contracts, are very significant. Because what these documents reveal is that the devices that the TSA described to the vendors, in other words, the specifications that the agency outlined, was for devices that had the ability to store and record and transmit images of the naked human body. Now, I am quite sure there is going to be some back and forth this morning about what that means. Uh, the agency will say, for example, that they don't save the images, they store them for a temporary basis, and then they are uh, deleted. Uh, but I need to make very clear at this point that we have done a lot of related litigation on this issue, and we have obtained, for example, from the U.S. Marshal Service uh, more than 100 images of a body scanner device very similar to the one used by the TSA. This is used by the Marshal Service in Orlando, Florida, in a courthouse. Uh, the image is routinely uh, stored and recorded. The TSA itself, subsequent to the documents that we obtained, acknowledged that, in fact, they were storing and recording images in test mode. And then when last year, I believe, Chairman Thompson pushed them a bit further on that, they also acknowledged that they were storing and recording images in training mode. And now we know that the agency has over 2,000 images, and I am referring back to the TSA, detailed images, 2,000, they will not turn over to us um, because they, for whatever reason, I think, don't want the public to see this. Okay, I'll, I'll, I will conclude. There is a lot in my testimony. Uh, but just in conclusion, the privacy issues here are enormous. The Fourth Amendment implications are enormous. There is the harm that we can see about these devices, and then there is the harm we can't. And that is what I am here to, to discuss. Th thank you. We will we'll now move to uh, Dr. Brenner. Uh, same thing. Please pay attention to the light. If you keep your comments to five minutes, we would appreciate it. And we now, now recognize you for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is David Brenner, and I am the director of the Center for Radiological Research at uh, Columbia University, and have about 30 years of experience in low-dose radiation risk uh, estimation. So I think one should preface any comments by saying that improved uh, scanning of, of uh, humans at airports is both desirable and, and, and clearly necessary. Um, as you know, there, there are actually two different uh, AIT, advanced imaging technologies, that are currently being deployed. That is uh, X-ray backscatter scanners and millimeter wave scanners. And in many ways, they operate uh, in exactly the same way. Uh, they are both, the analogy is radar. They bounce radiation off the individual and the reflected radiations are, are what are analyzed. The difference, uh, as in the names, is that the X-ray backscanners use X-rays, millimeter waves do not. And at least at, at higher radiation doses, it is certainly proven that uh, X-rays uh, are a carcinogen. Um, there is no such evidence for millimeter waves. So I will focus my comments on uh, X-ray backscatter scanners. So let us talk about the individual risk, the risk of one average person going through the scanner once. Um, the, the doses uh, uh, involved are extremely low, and that means that the uh, risks, and the risks we are talking about are long-term radiation-induced cancer, are also extremely low. And in fact, we can actually put some numbers uh, on those risks. So the risk of an average person going through the scanner, their risk of a, a long-term uh, induced cancer is about 1 in 10 million. Now, by any stretch of the imagination, that is an extremely small risk. So I think I would agree with the TSA's characterization that in that context, uh, these devices are safe. Um, uh, of course, there are, there are um, caveats there. Uh, frequent flyers, for example, who can go through a scanner 200 times a year, the risk would be 200 times that. Uh, air flight personnel can go through the scanners three or 400 times a year, so the risks are correspondingly higher. And there are also populations that are more sensitive than average, and children are, are the biggest example there. Children are more sensitive to radiation-induced cancer than, than adults are. So that is individual risk. So I would certainly go along with a general consensus that uh, you can consider them safe in that context. 
But there is another way that we always need to think about risk, uh, and that's what we usually call either public health or population risk. And that's to do with both the individual risk and the number of people exposed to that risk. If you have a small risk, but only a few people are exposed to that risk, there's not much public health concern. But if you have a small risk and very large numbers of people exposed, then you get a public health concern. And of course, the issue here is that the TSA's uh, plan now is to, they would, the goal is to have everybody scanned with these, uh, these new technologies. And number-wise, that means uh, 700 million scans a year at the moment, increasing in a few years to a billion scans a year. So we're talking about an extraordinarily large number of uh, scanners. And you can make a population estimate. Well, how many uh, cancers would you think would be produced by a year's worth of scanning if you had a billion scans? And the answer is, is around 100. Um, 100 uh, cancers a year produced by a billion scans. Um, it's important to stress there's a lot of uncertainties uh, involved in that number, but it's, it's the best we can do, and it's done with fairly standard uh, approaches. So even with 100 cancers a year, you could certainly make the argument, well, we're talking about risks and benefits here. The benefits of uh, not having our airplanes blown up would, uh, would, would uh, in fact, counteract that you know, relatively small risk. But because we have two technologies here, the millimeter wave scanners and the X-ray scanners, and both are apparently equally effective at doing uh, what they're designed to do, uh, but the millimeter wave scanners do not have that uh, potential for a long-term population risk, but the X-ray scanners do, uh, to our mind, it makes a lot of sense that we should be thinking more about the, using the millimeter wave scanners and less about using the uh, X-ray scanners. And I'll stop my testimony there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We applaud anybody who, <laughs> who leaves a good solid eight seconds on the clock. We, we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Kate, you are now recognized for, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I have his eight seconds as, as well? You have just a they've, they've come and gone. I would uh, also like to thank you and, um, and Mr. Tierney and your colleagues on this committee. Um, this is an extraordinarily important subject because the TSA is an agency that touches probably more Americans than any other agency which has the power that it has. And now, of course, it is touching them far more intimately and in an environment in which um, they either choose not to fly or to be subject to that uh, scrutiny. And because so much of the work they do is governed by uh, policies and procedures which are not made public, the review data on this equipment largely not made public, the oversight of this committee is exceptionally critical, perhaps more so than in any other uh, area. I have been asked to address AIT effectiveness. And this is a somewhat complicated issue because we can talk about the effectiveness of machines or we can, I think, more profitably talk about the effectiveness of the machines as they add to a system of security that the TSA is carrying out at airports. And it is in that latter context that I think we can say quite safely that AITs have introduced a distraction into the security system that may actually be weakening rather than enhancing our security at airports. It is useful to remember what AITs do. They do not detect explosives. They do not detect firearms. They do not distinguish um, dangerous from ordinary materials. All they can do is identify what they consider to be anomalies on the body of a traveler. Now, that is a pretty limited function. It means if the traveler secretes something internally or even in his or her mouth and closes the mouth, they can get through security without the AIT detecting it. It also means that if we define anomaly as the TSA currently do, does to mean anything that looks different than what they would expect, we are generating millions of false positives a year. This is, of course, why we have to take tissues out of our pocket and dollar bills and candy. All of these are considered anomalies by the AIT. So despite the fact that we uh, uh, um, these have been advertised to the American public on the basis they can see through clothing to really see if you present a risk. The opposite is, in fact, true. They cannot determine what a risk is. And therefore, we have turned the TSA largely into cloakroom attendants who are trying to get all of our anomalous goods off of us so that we can go through the machine, thereby leaving less for the TSA to have to screen. 
This high rate of false positives is one reason for concern. Another is that we, in fact, have a very difficult time clearing the anomalies that do go through the system. Because, in fact, even with a pat-down search, we often don't know what those anomalies are. And uh, I mentioned in my written testimony, I was reminded of this last week flying through Washington National Airport. I had uh, dropped an aspirin in my pocket, forgotten it was there. The machine identified this as an anomaly. You would think this billion-dollar technology could tell the difference between a tiny little aspirin and something that might pose a threat, but it cannot. So therefore, this required a pat-down. The agent pulled it out and said, what is this? I said an aspirin. He said, thank you, go right on through. Of course, he had no idea what it was. Right? Once I had been subjected to the search, whether it was a dangerous chemical, whether it was an explosive, no earthly idea. He simply let me put it in my pocket, and I walked through. The search had gained us nothing. That is actually true, um, and following on our first witness this morning, with most medical devices. And I experienced this as a diabetic who wears an insulin pump. So I walk through. If I have the insulin pump on, I am then either subject to a complete pat-down, as if for some reason having an insulin pump makes it more likely that I will be a terrorist, or if I take the insulin pump off, I am still left with a plastic cannula in my stomach that carries the insulin. This, of course, is an anomaly. I then become subject to another pat-down. The agent feels it and says, what is that? I say, it is a cannula. Okay, 8 out of 10 have no idea what that is anyway. They say, thank you very much. They are invariably polite, and I walk on through. Right? One out of five say, oh, you are on an insulin pump. They are invariably polite, and I walk on through. Now, when I ask the TSA what it is about cannulas that they are so worried, they say, well, we are worried you might have bombs inside of you, and this would be the mechanism for setting it off. I have no idea how great that threat is. I do know that agent has no idea at the end of the AIT and the search whether that is true or not. All they know is that they detected a plastic piece of tubing coming out of my uh, stomach, and I gave them an excuse for it. Now, let me conclude by saying I, too, am enormously respectful of the difficult and important job the TSA has and would also comment on the extent to which so many TSA agents that I encounter are uh, invariably courteous and I think extremely well-intentioned. I think they are as frustrated as we are by the irrational policies they are being asked to carry out. Thank you. And even more impressive, only one second on the clock. The Chair cannot thank you enough for wrapping up your testimony. I challenge Mr. Baker to meet, beat that goal here as, as we recognize him now for five minutes. Push the, push the button there. Yes. I, I appreciate being here. I uh, would like to just make three or four points. Uh, first, <clears throat> we obviously can't start this analysis by what we would like TSA to do. We have to start with what Al Qaeda wants to do, and want, Al Qaeda clearly wants to blow up planes over the United States if it possibly can. It is very conscious of what our security protocols are, uh, and it shapes its weapons to meet them. If we stop uh, uh, looking for uh, uh, shoe bombs, they are going to use shoe bombs. If we stop looking for underwear bombs, they are going to use underwear bombs. Given that, my second point is, with that constraint, knowing it has to look for those weapons, and with one big caveat, TSA's uh, measures are relatively effective and appropriately shaped to the nature of the threat. Uh, uh, they have only changed their protocols, by and large, in response to demonstrated threats that were actual plots that could have brought down planes. And by and large, each of the changes they have made is aimed at finding those particular weapons. I won't go into the privacy protections that have been built into the uh, AIT systems. Uh, you will be hearing from the uh, uh, TSA about those. Uh, but they are, by and large, effective. Uh, I have been through pat-downs. I think uh, I would take issue with the people who describe it as akin to a sexual assault. I thought it was very professional. Uh, and uh, while I would much prefer to go through a scanner, uh, the pat-downs are not uh, a shocking experience. At least they were not for me. Uh, but let me return to the caveat, because I think there is a way in which TSA is not doing what it should and could. Uh, it is still looking for weapons. All of the measures that it has adopted since 9-11 are focused on looking for weapons. Uh, and as Representative Cisna said, the result is we are all treated as though we are potential terrorists. We are all suspects. We are all treated the same way and screened in the same fashion. 
Um, we do not look for terrorists. Uh, and that's the reason TSA does not look for terrorists is it doesn't know enough about the people that it is dealing with to actually identify even a risky traveler. It doesn't know as much as a uh, state trooper who stops someone on the highway knows about the person they have just stopped. It certainly doesn't know as much as other DHS elements like the Customs and Border Protection Agency know about people coming across the border, uh, where, the, in fact, the, uh, they know more and are able to move the uh, travelers much faster. It doesn't even know as much as United Airlines. If you, if you said who is going to do a better job of using data to find terrorists, United Airlines would have more data to use than TSA. This does not make sense. Uh, and that brings me to my last point, which is that uh, um, we have probably taken the search for weapons as far as we can. I know there are people who think that we have taken it too far. Um, there certainly are possibilities for weapons. I don't think we have yet developed Fred Kate's aspirin bomb, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, there are certainly possible weapons and places to hide them that uh, our search for weapons is not going to find them. Uh, and uh, therefore, we are going to have to spend more time looking for possible terrorists, risky travelers. And I would submit that most people who travel today would say, if I could give information, if, if the uh, the fact that I was just discharged from the hospital after uh, uh, an operation was information that was available to TSA so they could verify my story and speed me through uh, uh, the, uh, the line, that would be a much better step than having everyone screened in the fashion they are currently screened. Uh, and so my suggestion for this committee, for the uh, uh, Homeland Security Committee, is that we allow TSA to set up some voluntary programs. We are already giving people a choice between a pat-down and a, uh, a scan. Why not let people say, you know, you can have my travel information, you can have some basic background information on me. If that will make the screening more effective and faster, I would rather do that than go through the scan every time or the pat-down every time. And so my suggestion for uh, ways to improve the system that we have and potentially reduce some of the intrusiveness of some of the screening is to begin a process in which people can voluntarily agree that they will give up information in exchange for faster screening. Thank you. Thank you. I, I continue to be impressed by the prompt nature of our, our panel. I would duly note that for future panels uh, moving forward. Nevertheless, uh, we would love to move to the questioning phase. I am going to start by recognizing myself for, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Baker, I think you make an important point, that there are many of us that are concerned that what happens at the TSA is more TSA screening theater than it is about truly targeting and highlighting those that pose the greatest risks. Um, I, for one, believe that the challenge before this country is how do we become more effective and less invasive, that we should not have to give up all of our personal privacy in order to secure an airplane. Nobody needs to look at my kids or my grandmother or whatever naked in order to secure an airplane. And we as Americans should demand that we raise the bar on both and protect people's personal privacy. Uh, and we shouldn't accept anything less. I would ask unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, three articles uh, that deal with the same topic. Uh, this first one, $19 billion later, Pentagon's best bomb detector is a dog. The Pentagon, having spent $19 billion trying to ferret out uh, improvised explosive devices and the components thereof, have come to the conclusion that the very best way to actually find these bomb-making materials, whether they be in a car or on somebody's person, is the good old-fashioned dog. There is nothing like a good German shepherd that can be a whole lot less invasive, a much less costly. My fear is that what these dogs don't have, they don't have lobbyists. And, and I really do worry that we have propelled ourselves into this false sense of security that these machines work, that they are safe, and that we are not storing any images. And I have challenges on all three of those fronts because I, I, through my research and the information I have seen, I don't know that that is true. So, again, I would ask unanimous consent to enter these three into the record. Uh, no objection, but just a question, Mr. Chairman. Are those the actual studies or are those just articles about? Those are the articles referencing the study. Thank you. Without objection, they will be entered into the record. 
Um, let's talk with, particularly with this panel, uh, I want to start with you, Dr. Brenner, uh, talk about the, the safety and efficacy. I worry about a couple of the more vulnerable people, the 65,000 people at the TSA that are around in close proximity to these machines on a daily basis. We also have people that are pregnant women. We probably have pregnant TSA or TSOs that are there working at the airports. We have people with pacemakers, for instance. Uh, there was an article that was released. Uh, it was in USA Today it, uh, with a statement that came from TSA on a Friday uh, saying that the, uh, the machines that they had tested were admitting 10 times the allowable dose of radiation or the, the, the normal dose of radiation. Um, do you have any insight into the release of that data and that information? Um, well, coming to the, your, your final comment about the, the, the uh, factor of 10, my understanding is it was an arithmetical error in analyzing the data and probably Are you aware of who actually really? conducted the tests on the machines? No, I am not. My, my understanding is that the, the people that actually conducted the test on the machines was the manufacturer of the machines. Does, do you have any insight as to whether or not that's, uh, how that strikes you? Well, it doesn't give you a great deal of confidence, of course. I guess that's one. As a member here, this this concerns me. The people conducting the tests on the machines are the manufacturers, and even they have come to the conclusion that one third of their machines are emitting ten times. Now they'll they'll say that that is a mathematical error. It was a training error. We didn't calculate it properly. But I. We can't make mistakes with pregnant women. We can't make mistakes with people with pacemakers. Do you, what would be the effect of somebody who is repeatedly in high doses exposed to that type of, of radiation? Well, let me come back to your, your first comment. Uh, it is very true that the general scientific uh, community does not have access to doing measurements on these machines. So we are reliant on uh, studies that are commissioned uh, either by the TSA or by the manufacturers. Mr. Rotenberg, what has been your experience in trying to access that type of data and information along the way? From the TSA, we have actually, uh, Mr. Chairman, we recently uh, uh, submitted a FOIA request uh, to the agency to make those materials available. We don't have expertise in that field, but it is our view that that information should be available uh, to Dr. Brenner and others, so that those with the expertise are able to provide some independent judgment. Uh, Mr. Rotenberg, if I could, and, and, and Mr. Kate, very swiftly, my time's a, the Ninth Circuit Court. The uh, Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals has uh, allowed TSA pat-downs to be deemed as legal as long as it is, quote, limited in its intrusiveness as is consistent with the satisfaction of the administrative need that justify it. Do you care to comment on that? Very briefly, well, my time has expired. Yes, just very briefly. Both the Ninth Circuit and the Third Circuit, this was an opinion by then Judge Alito, have said that these techniques have to be minimally invasive and effective. And our case against the TSA is that, in fact, they meet neither test. Mr. Mr. Gay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I would just echo that and add, um, when the National Academy of Sciences panel met for two years to look at the question of programs such as this, it recommended adoption of a framework that Congress would require agencies wanting to deploy equipment like this for to determine both intrusiveness into privacy and effectiveness. It would do this on the record to the extent consistent with national security goals, and it would do it in a way so that Congress could provide effective oversight, despite the fact that TH uh, DHS actually paid for that study, it has not implemented the frameworks. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired. Now I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Deering. I just want to comment, Mr. Chairman. The panel did a much better job of keeping the time than the chairman did. So, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and not being a stickler time. for time, I don't, I don't say that Duly other than as humor. Guilty on that as charged. I, I agree. I think we need to take the time we need to take on this uh, on this serious issue. But um, you all did much better. So thank you. Um, let me just follow through, uh, Mr. Kate. I, first of all, I thought your testimony was was very interesting and very good. And I thank you for it. But I thought one of the interesting parts, are you an expert on, on the technical security aspect or on privacy aspects? Excuse me. Uh, I am certainly an expert on the privacy aspects. I am also an expert on security systems, but not the technical side of this. That is why I, I didn't direct my testimony to that point. I, mean, I thought a number of the comments you made, I sort of been expecting the, the privacy angle, and then you hit it from the other angle. I thought a lot of your comments were very interesting. None more interesting, I think, than 
the last comment that you made about there uh, having been a recommendation by the National Academy of Sciences for a proposed framework for evaluating the effectiveness and privacy impact of any new systems and technologies. And your testimony is that the, um, the TSA is not doing that on every uh, plan that they put forward? Um, that is my testimony, um, right, sir. I, I would say, of course, if they are doing it in a classified environment, I would not know that. Right. They, I think we will have to ask them on that. It was interesting. Mr. Baker, do you know whether or not that is accurate? I don't know whether the particular framework recommended by the National Academy of Sciences was followed, but certainly these uh, machines were put through substantial testing uh, even at the beginning, at the end of the uh, Bush administration. So they have been in testing for quite some time. But we are just not sure whether it was the NAS uh, protocols or not. Yeah, and I, I, I have to say, you know, everybody has got an idea for how you could do this, this, this testing better, slower, have uh, public comment, have a uh, judicial review. But, you know, we had a, an underwear bomber in uh, Christmas of 2009. These machines were deployed in Thanksgiving of 2010. That was remarkably slowly. If we had waited for Mr. Cates' process, we would still be standing around with our hands in our pocket. All right. Uh, Dr. Brenner, can I just clear one thing up with you, because I, I think it is important on that. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody refutes the fact that there, there was a, a mathematical error made uh, by the manufacturer when we tested that. Am I, am I right in saying that? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. I mean, I just I think it is important that we understand what the situation is, but there was a mathematical error, and whether or not that makes them really, really, really bad on math and, uh, is, is one question, but I think we should just get the facts on that. Now, your testimony raises really potentially serious public health concerns, so I want to make sure I understand it correctly on this. The American College of Radiology released a statement, and it said, and I quote, it was not aware of any evidence that either of the scanning technologies that the TSA is considering would present significant biological risk for passengers screened, end quote. Before that, the Food and Drug Administration, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, and the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory all determined that the radiation doses for individuals being scanned by X-ray backscatter machines was minuscule and far, far below the accepted industry guidelines. So according to those studies, one X-ray backscatter scan is equivalent to roughly two minutes of traveling in an airplane at altitude, one hour spent outside, just generally outdoors, or eating one banana. Do you disagree that with any of those three studies uh, that say the total radiation exposure provided by one X-ray backscatter screening is roughly equivalent to those basic everyday activities? Um, well. I don't think it's equivalent to eating a banana, but uh, I do agree in general with the comment that the individual risk from a single tra uh, traversal of the machines is extremely small. And in fact, I gave you a risk estimate of one chance in 10 million, okay. which is, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, extremely small. So I, I don't have any uh, uh, disagreement with any of those comments, really, except the banana. So um, let me, now you say that your best estimate is that 1 billion X-ray backscatter whole body imaging scans will potentially cause 100 cancer incidents per year. Yeah, you multiply a billion by 1 in 10 million, and that's what you get. So does that mean that 100 people a year will be getting cancer from stepping outside or from taking a, a two minutes in an airplane? Uh, there is no doubt that a lot of uh, cancers that uh, we get in our, in our everyday existence, I mean, 40 percent of us get cancer, uh, are radiation uh, induced. We know this to be true. But, I mean, so uh, but those are unavoidable. The question is, well, this is potentially avoidable. Okay. All right. No, I get it. But I am just trying to understand it better. So, yes, you might have 100 cases for being outdoors. Yes, you might have 100 cases for spending two minutes in an airplane at altitude. Uh, and, yes, maybe the, there would be some impact uh, for going through these scanners on that, but it is all about the same. I, I would agree with that. I think the general issue is uh, because you have one risk in your life, that doesn't mean you have to accept other risks in your life when you don't have to. Mm -hmm. And you say it is perfectly possible that the individual risk could actually be significantly lower or indeed zero, but that it is also quite possible the individual risk could actually be significantly higher. Yeah, I think that is true. I, I, I mean, Trying to rest, estimate risks at these very low doses is, is very hard to do. Right. All we can do is the best. Uh, so, did make you the best effort? Did you do your own tests on the emissions caused by these uh, X-ray backscatter machines, or did you base your estimates on uh, just on estimates of the emissions? Well, as I commented to the chairman just now, uh, it would be great if the scientific community actually had access to these machines. We do not. Okay. Good. Thank you.
yield back, uh, having used less time than you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Without noting the time, we will go ahead and move to recognizing uh, the gentleman from Arizona for five minutes. Dr. Brenner, um, I am a I, in my former life was a dentist for 25 years. So we do understand that there is all cumulative aspects of all radiation. Am I not right? Yes, that is correct. And so cumulatively, um, how would you compare this to a full series of X-rays in the same type of radiation, and put it in layman terms? Uh, the, the doses are much lower than, than a series of e even of dental X-rays, even when they are uh, ideally done. Um, the, the key is ideally done, right? The key, the key because, is ideally done. Indeed. Because a lot of scientific method is based upon peer-reviewed applications, is it not? Correct. And, and not having that availability, we are subject, subjective um, to the industry's um, oversight, are we not? We are in terms of estimating, uh, trying to get a best handle on the actual radiation exposures. Trying to then go from radi radiation exposure to risk is another story that we are not de particularly dependent on uh, industry. But the, the, the basic thing you start with is, well, what was the radiation dose? And there is certainly uncertainty there. Well, it seems to me that the, the point that we keep bringing up in this committee is, is uh, self-reporting numbers based upon government agencies. And so we are reliant on what the government gives us. And it doesn't seem that uh, we are parlaying those or comparing apples to apples. You know, a lot of times we are comparing apples to tangerines. So we are having some problems with that data. And that seems to be the biggest problem here. Uh, Mr. Baker, you alluded to, to something very interesting to me. Um, I am from Arizona as well. Um, and you talk about a multi-tier task uh, effect, that um, TSA is not really gifted in the regards to analyzing certain factors of, of the passengers. And, and actually noted something about um, border security. Isn't there a place here for interagencies to be developing um, cross-referencing of looking at passengers? And what would hold that up? Absolutely, there is. Uh, uh, CBP has access to a lot of information uh, and uses it well. They, uh, they, they essentially scrutinize closely about one out of 200 uh, of the people who cross the border, and the rest just walk through, it is 30 seconds or less, uh, showing their passport. Uh, uh, and uh, providing more of that information to TSA so that TSA can make decisions about the kind of screening it will uh, do for passengers is something that should happen. It has begun to happen, I understand, in the context of flights from Europe to the United States. That is to say, it is not so much that the information is shared, but that there are shared decision-making processes. Uh, I think TSA will be a little nervous about getting that information because in the past, Congress, uh, Fred Kate, uh, Epic have made a big fuss about them having any information about travelers claiming that uh, TSA has a travel dossier on us. Uh, and so it would be very helpful if they got a certain amount of um, authorization or encouragement to actually use the data in a constructive fashion rather than just uh, um, try to do it on their own with CBP. Um. Mr. Brenner, again, based upon um, the quality of the image, you know, I am sitting here with a dental x-ray, and if I don't have qualifications or, or um, the parameters set on my machine, they are worthless to me. And we have now come about seeing the experts talking about, we don't really know what is in um, the general uh, perimeters of this, this, this scan. We are looking for abnormalities. In your opinion, does it justify the spending of almost a half a billion dollars on these machines and going further with this? Well, you are asking me about the efficacy of the machines, yes, and I don't think I am uh, perhaps the, the, the right person to address that. I am no expert. I'm, there have certainly been studies where they have analyzed the, uh, the quality of the images, worked backwards to figure out, well, how much radiation dose uh, must have been given to produce those images, and that is actually from Arizona State. And the conclusion was the doses had to be higher than the, uh, the doses that uh, the manufacturers are suggesting. Mr. Cates, do you have an opinion upon that? Uh, on, the, on, the, on the broader issue of whether these are ineffective, uh, are they worth the risk? I would say they are not worth the risk. And in fact, would, much to his annoyance, support Mr. Baker's earlier point, uh, which is in fact knowing more about travelers or certainly those that wish to have more known about them 
uh, would be a far more effective way. One of the things we always say in security is you want to focus your resources on the greatest risk. We have built the entire TSA system around doing the exact opposite. Thank you very much. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back within a, an impressive time frame. Thank you. I now recognize the gentleman from Maryland for five minutes. Mr. Uh, Baker, I want to just follow up on some of the uh, questions that our ranking member, Mr. Tierney, asked. And if you will recall, he was asking about uh, a number of issues. But, and there seems to be um, some, you know, they look at these measurements in different ways. And so we are in a situation where Congress has to make critical decisions about our nation's homeland security and the public health based on scientific evidence. And it seems to be all kinds of ways they do these measurements. But, and questions have, been, have come up with regard to uh, those measurements. But considering the conflicting scientific estimates on this issue and the significance of the security risks, what do you think, Mr. Baker, should be the next steps um, that Congress should take? Should we request further scientific analysis uh, on the actual results of these machines instead of just using extrapolated estimates? Is that I am not a medical expert, uh, and so I am cautious about expressing a view on that. I can tell you there are some costs to delay, not only uh, uh, the risks to the traveling pub public, but uh, uh, for those who are worried about uh, um, uh, waste and abuse in government, uh, right now there are two competing machine suppliers to do body imaging. If you say we are not going to buy from the people who use uh, uh, backscatter X-ray, then you are giving the other machine supplier a monopoly and you are going to get a price that reflects that monopoly. So it will have a significant cost, uh, and I think you need to bear that in mind as you make a decision. Well, Professor Cade, um a privacy law professor at Indiana University has stated uh, in his written testimony, and I quote, advanced imaging technology is generally not effective at contributing to greater security of airplanes and airports. In fact, it appears that the way in which the TSA has deployed these machines actually may be determining, undermining rather, the security of the U.S. air transportation infrastructure, end of quote. Mr. Baker, do you agree with Professor Cates' assessment? No. I, I, I think that uh, these clearly add to our security. Uh, it, perhaps if, if you compared this technology to some imaginary technology that was perfect, uh, you would say, well, these machines are not uh, as good as that imaginary technology. But if you compare them to the magnetometers that are the alternative for us, uh, they are clearly much more effective at finding things that now could be used as weapons that couldn't be used uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, they are very likely the best alternative we have today. Obviously, it would be great to find something better. I am a big believer in dogs, uh, uh, but they only really work for about half an hour, and then they have to go play, uh, and they cost thirty dollars or $40,000 a year on that basis. So it is a, uh, uh, it's a great solution. I, although I, guess I have to say I have a golden retriever whose searches of me are substantially more intrusive than the TSA ever has been. I, I, and uh, uh, therefore, I would say we should continue to look for new technologies, but this may be the best we have for deployment in the next five years. Now, TSA has evaluated and tested advanced imaging technology in the field since 2007 and deployed the machines widely in 2010. Mr. Baker, in your experience, have the AIT uh, systems been adequately tested for field use? And are you aware of any other technology that is readily deployable on a mass scale and has a reasonable chance of uh, preventing a terrorist attack from explosives brought on to an airplane? I am not. You know, we, we did do quite a bit of testing uh, in 2007, 2008. We had high hopes for the puffer machines, which would use explosive detections, uh, de detection, uh, basically a, an, an electronic nose, and they just didn't work uh, reliably enough. Uh, uh, the AITs 
are much more reliable. They are not perfect, and I would be happier if we could use chemical sampling than the uh, technique that AIT uses, but we haven't found a way to make that work effectively yet. Finally, uh, in his testimony, Mr. Rottenberg advocates that TSA or Congress should suspend the use of AIT for primary screening. In 2009, legislation passed the House that would restrict the use of AIT to secondary screening only. In other words, only if the change in your pocket set off the metal detector would you be directed to a whole body scanner. Mr. Baker, based on your experience, does, does it make sense to use the AIT only for secondary screening? No, I think, I think that is nuts. I, a, the whole point of the underwear bomb was that he didn't set off the magnetometer because it was designed not to set off the magnetometer. And so only using a technology that would find an underwear bomb when somebody has set off the magnetometer is to basically use it in context where it doesn't matter. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Now I recognize the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. Thank you. And I'll I appreciate if the witnesses would indulge me as I kind of bounce around with a, several different questions. Uh, Mr. Baker, you have indicated that you have uh, undergone the pat-down and did not find them intrusive. Was this just the pat-down you took when you opted out, or have you triggered an anomaly in one of the machines and received the secondary, more intrusive pat-down? Uh, I have gotten the opt-out search, uh, and I have set off the anomalies with change in my pocket, uh, but the search consisted of having to show what had set off the anomaly. So uh, I am I'm confident there are certain kinds of anomalies that would produce a more detailed search, but I haven't been through it. I have. <laughs> you don't want to be through it. Um, let me, this one is to uh, Dr. Brenner. Uh, have you done any uh, studies with regard to exposure of the TSA agents who are there. I know in typical radiological applications, uh, X ray technicians are required to wear detection devices to determine their cumulative exposure uh, to radiation. Uh, are we doing anything to protect our TSA agents from uh, radiation that may spill out of these machines? Well, of course, a film badge, a uh, film monitor won't protect uh, the, the TSA agents, but it will certainly give an estimate for future use as to whether they are being exposed. And it makes no sense to me at all that they are not wearing film badges. I mean, in uh, any academic setting and any medical setting, anybody who has any association with ionizing radiation wears a film badge. Now, I don't know if you are married or not, but uh, assume, I am going to assume you are. Would you let your pregnant wife go through one of these machines? I probably would not. Okay, and are, you indicate that the back scan or the back spatter X-ray is more dangerous than the military, millimeter wave technology. Uh, are there any risks associated with the millimeter wave technology we're aware of at this point in time? Well, as, as, as scientists, we're trained never to say something is perfectly safe, but there's no evidence of uh, risks associated with the millimeter waves. And there are no biological mechanisms that are established that would uh, lead us to, to conclude that there are risks associated with them, which is in contrast to the X-ray situation where we know exactly how X-rays cause cancer. Great. And uh, Mr. Rundberg, your EPIC uh, organization is a privacy advocacy group that I have been familiar with for uh, some time. And I understand you alls stance uh, the, uh, on the intrusiveness of these, especially the ones that show the image and not the Gumbies. Um, what would your organization's stance be, or if you can't speak for your organization, your personal stance be on actual uh, a voluntary trusted traveler program where the government is able to database certain information about you to uh, allow you to bypass uh, th this type of invasive scanning? We have studied those programs as well. And I, I think what we've concluded is that there's simply no uh, silver bullet. Uh, for example, uh, the Clear Traveler Program, which was a registered traveler program, that company, which had collected a lot of biometrics on frequent flyers, over 100,000 deep background uh, checks, so that they could get that certification and go through the lines more quickly, uh, actually found themselves in financial trouble. And they, they, yeah, they went out of business right after I gave them my credit card. Yes. So <laughs> they, I can sympathize with that. But, but you see, the story gets worse, because having collected this extraordinary amount of personal information used to conduct the authentication in the airport, 
That was their chief business asset. And they turned around and wanted to sell the database that they had acquired on American travelers. And it took a class of the customers of the company to actually go into court in New York and say, you can't do that. You can't sell our personal information that way. So my warning here, and, and while I don't actually disagree that I think a lot could be done to improve the uh, assessment of passengers, it is one of the recommendations of the uh, IATA, um, this particular approach has been tried. Uh, and, and there are some risks. Do you think uh, the airlines might be a better organization to do it? I know, uh, I know Continental Airlines keeps pretty good track of me, and every time I get 35,000 miles, they give me a free trip. Uh, they know I think it is 25,000 on United, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. Hopefully we will get the better end in the merger there. Uh, that, that may be. Well, yes. I mean, this is one of the things that has always seemed a little odd to me. In other words, if the concern is trying to make sure that the people you know, which is another way of saying the people you can trust, go through more quickly, the airlines do have that information. Those are their frequent flyers. And the people you know less well are the ones you probably want to look at a little bit more closely. That is actually the basis of the approach that is now recommended by the International Aviation Transportation Association. Thank you. I yield back my negative two seconds. <laughs> hey, thank the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. We now recognize the gentlewoman from Texas for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I am going to, gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. I ask some uh, uh, rapid fire uh, questions, if I might. Um, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Brenner, is there anything uh, that we can do to fix the AIT machines, in your opinion? Well, recall there are two different types of machines. The millimeter waves, that as far as we know don't have uh, X ray, uh, don't have uh, long term cancer right, risks the present, associated with them. The present ones that. The, the X ray machines uh, potentially do. And certainly one of the things that we should do is have these machines available to the general scientific community to study them rather than just have to use uh, secondhand information. So, and you can see the point that uh, some of the uh, filings and reporting were incorrect in terms of the amount of radiation. You can see that point. Well, I, I think there is a more general uh, uh, suggestion that the doses are rather higher than the, uh, the well, manufacturers but, but are stating, apart heard, from this recent issue. You have heard the testimony that some of the reporting was incorrect, right? Yes, I have. But and they had corrected it, and therefore it would be under what might be uh, damaging or troubling. Well, certainly in the X-ray world, we, we believe there is actually no threshold below which the risk becomes zero. And your comment uh, is, uh, as you as you talked about the two distinctive aspects of radiation, um, your concern with the present current technology AIT is what. The, the concern is that uh, although the risk is very, very small, that I think everybody agrees for any individual going through the scanner, if you have a billion scans a year, which is which where we are heading, uh, a very large number of uh, scans, with each with a small individual risk, will ultimately lead to a population But would you uh, concede, uh, and, and I take issue with the billions, uh, though I know that our previous witness indicated that travel for her is airplane. Would you concede that it would be important to mend it and not end it, to try to mend the situation uh, that we are addressing? Is it security an equal concern as well? Yeah. I mean, of course we are trying to make a risk-benefit balance, and that is hence my comment about millimeter waves and I thank relative you. to X-rays. Mend it, not end it. Dr. Baker, excuse me, Mr. Baker, are you familiar with the lone wolf concept and uh, know that we have seen each other before. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Um, uh, familiar with the individual acts of terrorism, uh, don't need to be in a crowd. Um, were we, had we ever seen before uh, the shoe bomber uh, that kind of incident? Was that a first for the United States? That was a first. Was it a first for the United States on Mr. Abdullah on that fateful Christmas Day when we discovered uh, someone had uh, enhance their body. That was a first as well. Then can you um, suggest, uh, uh, if I could very quickly, uh, refer you to uh, Administrator Pistol's comments about the idea of a multilayer uh, concept of technology, uh, excuse me, of, um, of imaging, that image, advanced imaging technology fits into the multilayered approach of security. Is that important? I, I think it is. We, we have to give Al Qaeda a sense, a strong sense that their old tactics won't work, uh, and 
the advanced image technology is the only approach, other than some very uh, intrusive uh, pat-downs, uh, that make us reasonably comfortable that uh, uh, Al Qaeda can't slip bombs into their underwear and get onto planes. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's it's our best current use in the context of a uh, broad, layered approach. And you can see that we live in a new world, a different world. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Rottenberg, um, I have been a strong champion of the Fourth Amendment and the uh, opposition to unreasonable search and seizure. You testify that AIT may be capable of storing and transmitting images of passengers. TSA has testified that both types of machines employed by TSA are currently incapable of storing or transmitting images. Do you dispute TSA's testimony that the machines are currently incapable of storing or transmitting images? Absolutely. On what basis? Page 9 of my testimony. That is the technical specifications for the So devices. are you suggesting that you want to completely eliminate a major force in security, or would you suggest that we mend it and not end it? Well, to be clear, I think our techniques have to be effective, and I think they have to comply with the Fourth Amendment. I don't well, think let me, this device let me just, does either. Uh, let me just indicate to you that I am introducing legislation that will require TSA to uh, retain but also indicate that they cannot in any way hold these uh, images or they have no capacity to do so. Would that be of comfort to you? I would like to see the technical specifications. I am saying if you look at page 9, it will tell you exactly what they can do. They can enable, disable the image filters. They can access the test mode. They can export raw image data in test mode. That is what the TSA required that the vendors provide to them well, in the TSA design of these devices. That. I would well, just, well, I, Mr. Chairman, I would, would just end on saying that um, I think uh, Mr. Rottenberg's representation is his, and uh, we will look forward to making sure that we fix but not end uh, this uh, problem. Thank you. Back. Thank you. The gentlewoman yields back. We now uh, recognize the gentleman from Florida, the chairman of the Transportation Committee, Mr. Micah, for five minutes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> when um, I had the responsibility for putting together the transportation security system for the United States after the 9-11 uh, attacks, um, you look, uh, of course, I looked for different models. Um, uh, British uh, probably were the best in advising us because they are the only country that had a countrywide system for screening and also uh, they had you know, been plagued by terrorist attack domestically uh, for years. Additionally, I contacted uh, various uh, Federal agencies and um, I talked to uh, those who run the Federal maximum security prisons and uh, other State uh, uh, organizations who also uh, dealt with probably the most uh, invasive types of uh, screening of uh, both prisoners and people who visited them. And, uh, I was told by them that even with um, body cavity searches, which I don't even want to describe here, with uh, screening, uh, with electronic equipment, that both um, drugs, counterband, weapons all penetrated the system. I've uh, been a strong advocate of using whatever means we can put in place that would provide us uh, security, but, uh, and I do believe in a layered system, but we've, we have launched uh, several uh, efforts, very expensive. Uh, when the Chechen women bombers uh, uh, destroyed uh, aircraft, uh, we, we, we were seeking a quick solution. Uh, we knew we didn't have uh, deployed at the airports uh, the equipment and uh, I was told the puffer would be the answer. I went to New Jersey and they tested the puffer. Went through the puffer at least three times with um, some uh, material that should have set it off. None of the three times did it set it off, but I was assured it was just a technical problem. 
and that they would be used. They started, as you know, an expensive deployment. Um, I was not advised when they uh, did when they were deploying the back scatter and uh, the uh, millimeter wave, although I did encourage them to look at millimeter wave, I must say, and have been supportive of using advanced technology. But I think the important thing is testing. Now, I was told the puffers would work and they didn't work. God only knows where they are sitting, and I asked the committee staff to look at that fiasco. Now we're going to buy we're buying a half a billion dollars worth of equipment. I've had that equi equipment tested. Uh, the results are classified, and I asked the members to uh, to review that. I can tell you the equipment is badly flawed. It can be subverted. Uh, our staff went out, and our staff subverted the equipment. Uh, they informed me in a very simple manner. Um, Mr. Pistol said, well, it may require more training or something, and GAO is clever. Well, uh, what the hell does he think the terrorists are? Terrorists have gone from a very sophisticated shoe device, and I visited Orly, met, interviewed people, saw what took place. I was awakened in Texas the morning of the liquid bombers, and we put in measures to try to deal with that. The diaper. Um, I had in January tested the system for the pat-down, which is supposed to catch what the, this equipment doesn't catch or be a, another device. I can tell you, I can thwart the system uh, not only visually, uh, but, uh, uh, and not that cleverly, but uh, uh, most folks know that they are not going to touch your junk, and uh, more than enough uh, dangerous material can get through because that system is flawed, too. Um, I am very concerned, again, about the testing of this equipment before it was deployed. Um, it looks like I've got, we've got a bigger puffer fiasco on our hands in buying this. If it wasn't just the half a billion, it's going to be another half a billion because TSA couldn't possibly use existing personnel or or transfer some of the positions, the 3,770 bureaucratic positions in Washington to, uh, to get their butts out working online. Of course, they are making $105,000 on average a year. And Mr. Pistol told me yesterday in testimony when I went before the Appropriations Committee that they start the average screener at $28,000 a year. Something seems out of a kilter. But uh, we have also seen them move uh, from diapers now to cargo. So th I think they are slightly bypassing these machines. Uh, would you say if they are planning to blow up planes over the sky with Good electronic point. remote devices, uh, would you say that that would be effective deterrent with these machines? I, I see all negative. Uh, let the record reflect all negative uh, head shakes there. Uh, finally, with um, finally, with the surgical implants, uh, I leave this question with you. Uh, we know that now the folks that gave us some of these devices and attempts are moving to body cavity inserts, uh, which we saw in Saudi Arabia, and surgical implants. Does this equipment? Can you tell me will that detect uh, that kind of a threat? I see, Mr. Kate. Uh, and Mr. Brenner, Doctor, can you, uh, you you need to verbalize this for the record? Um, no, it cannot. Mr. Brenner, doctor. I would confirm that uh, no, it cannot. It uh, can't penetrate. Mr. Rautenberg? No, it would not. Mr. Baker, you care to? I agree. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. We now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for their help with the committee. Uh, there are real privacy concerns raised by the use of the advanced imaging technology, and we are all looking for ways to maximize security while minimizing intrusions on that privacy. I understand that uh, TSA is currently testing software commonly used in Europe on AIT machines that shows only a screen with a human stick figure on it, something like this. Actually, this is more like, looks more like Gumby, 
than a stick figure, but um, this is uh, a way of uh, identifying an anomaly uh, on a passenger uh, without revealing you know, particular details of that person's body. And I think it is a, a better way from a privacy standpoint to uh, allow an officer to physically inspect uh, the area of the body where the anomaly occurred. Uh, but at no point in this system would, would any uh, human being ever see an actual picture of the, fa of the passenger being screened. And uh, once approved, TSA would be capable of deploying this software uh, across many of its machines in a matter of uh, weeks or, or months. Uh, Mr. Rotenberg, would, you, would the employment of this software resolve the principal AIT privacy concerns uh, raised by uh, EPIC in your litigation against TSA? Yeah, Mr. Lynch, it wouldn't. Um, and let me just make a few brief points. First of all, uh, regarding the European experience, it is important to note that very few European countries are adopting AIT. Um, Manchester Airport has it. Uh, Schiphol has it, which is where the automated target recognition software is being deployed. Italy tried it and then dropped it. Um, we are really alone right now at this point in treating air travelers as we do in this country. But people do point to Schiphol because they have deployed an ATR. Now, it is a different configuration. The other thing that you need to know about this is that the TSO will not be in a remote viewing location. The TSO will actually be standing now in front of the passenger looking at the so-called uh, Gumby image and then identifying on the person now in front of them, by the way, those areas of the body that alert for an anomaly. And that will then lead um, to the subsequent uh, pat-down to try to resolve what the anomaly is. Now, you could say that that is uh, less intrusive because the image is not as detailed. But of course, what the TSA told us previously was that the reason they had the TSO in a remote viewing facility was to avoid the problem of the TSO viewing the passenger. Now you are back into that realm of the ATR. The other problem is that the devices will still record the image in its unfiltered form. All of these techniques, the ATR is simply a photo processing technique. It is a bit like when you have a digital camera. You take a color photo, you can make it black and white, you can invert it, you can add sepia tone if you want to. But what you started with is the actual image, and that is still what TSA will have. And that remains our concern. We think more needs to be done to try to resolve the problem of the unfiltered image that the devices will capture. I see. Uh, but in terms of, well, let's, let's, let's uh, if there is no need, if they are not using the detailed image to make their assessment, I am assuming that it would be less problematic to get rid of that part of it then. Well, you see, it is a bit of a trade-off. The, the image that is displayed on the screen will be less detailed, no dispute. On the other hand, the image that is captured will be the same, and the TSO, instead of being in a remote room, will now be in front of the passenger. So that is roughly where you will end up. Well, the current system, the TSO is in front of the passenger. They have two, actually. There is the TSO in front of the passenger, and he is communicating by headset with another TSO who is in the remote viewing room. And the TSO in the remote viewing room says, we have got a problem under the right arm. You need to look there. But what, what I am saying is that neither the neither TSO under this, <laughs> under this scenario right. would be looking at the detailed image of the passenger. That is correct. It, it will be a generic uh, figure. Now, I will say that I don't see how the privacy dimension is, 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 is encountered here. If both TSOs are looking at this, right. what does it matter whether the person is in front of the passenger or not if they are not looking at a detailed image of the passenger? Well, because the device will capture. I, I understand that part and, of it. The and technology, it, right. And they are not using the. Right. detailed imaging for any purpose in this process. So I imagine that that could be deleted. It could be. I, I okay. want to point out also, in terms of the rollout of the ATR, when Administrator Pistol was asked about the use of this technique last November, I think this was in front of the Senate Commerce Committee, he expressed a lot of concern. He said it was, at least in testing, creating a lot of false positives. Okay. Now, it may be that TSA has 
has solved this. My time has expired. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. We now recognize the gentleman uh, uh, from California, the chairman of this committee, Mr. Eisner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it has really been helpful to, to hear the questions and answers coming before this, particularly, uh, Mr. Lynch, I appreciate yours, and I certainly appreciate uh, the, TSA, uh, the TSA, the Transportation Chairman, because I think a lot of people have worked hard on understanding how thoroughly useless this technology currently is. Now, that is an assumption I am making, but let us walk through it so that I make sure that, that I have an agreement. At the current time, with 57,000 TSA uh, professionals, we only check a small fraction of the passengers. Isn't that true? If you look at all the places, including San Diego, where, to be honest, we have all of them, all the stations are there, except in order to not back up well past downtown San Diego, they do random, they do anecdotal, if you will. So, first of all, from a security standpoint, we are not secure if the vast majority of passengers do not go through these if they are necessary. Do you all agree with that? Yes. Okay. No, Second, no I am sorry, I don't agree with you that. You don't agree? You think if we just pick up half of the people, we are going to stop a bomb? Ra random screening has a real value for deterring terrorists. They don't want to take the risk that they will get picked up by the random. These people are willing to blow themselves up, and you think they are scared of getting caught? I, absolutely. They do not want to get arrested uh, and fail. Uh, and so, uh, you know, random uh, screening does have a place. Uh, I, I would prefer that the so, screening So, okay. Well, let's let's continue along, because uh, uh, this is the old problem we have. You take away all of our civil rights and you say, but it has some value, but certainly not enough. Crazy people who put shoes in their bombs, you are saying that they wouldn't have done it if they thought they might be caught. Is that right, Mr. Baker? They wouldn't have done it if they thought they might be caught? Much less likely to try that, yes. Okay. So we will we'll assume that these products cut in half the likelihood of a bomb blowing up an airplane. We will we'll, we'll give you that. Is it worth 57,000 TSA individuals and the countless billions of dollars to cut in half but not, not even come close to eliminating that would be my rhetorical question. Mr. Rothenberg, I want to go through a couple of items with you. If it is possible to have technology do completely automated check using something similar to these products so that there is no human element except an X in the case of a high likelihood of something which is a legitimate anomaly, would you say that when that technology is ready to be used, you would consider it, if it met all of those requirements? I just want to quantify that you are not being unreasonable. You simply want a technology that currently doesn't exist. Is that right? Mr. Chairman, I don't think the technology has to be perfect. I don't think it would be realistic to expect a technology to be perfect. I think what I have uh, suggested, as, as Mr. Chaffetz has, is that the technology, technology should be effective. I think that is reasonable. And I think it should be minimally invasive, uh, because that is what the courts have told us that the Fourth Okay. Amendment. And at the current time, the false positives are huge. I have watched them. I mean, it doesn't take much to go through these lines and see every third or fourth person who actually goes through the machine in a secondary. Uh, and by the way, that is after they pause and wait for quite a while before they are allowed to go forward. Uh, Mr. Brenner, I am particularly interested because of your, uh, Dr. Brenner, I am sorry, your knowledge and experience. Do you remember the fluoroscopes of, uh, of yesteryear and, and what they did to people who had their shoes fitted using that technology? Oh, yes. And those devices uh, continued to be used well after it was pretty well established that there was uh, a risk associated with them. And my understanding is not only did they increase the likelihood of, of cancer for those who were having their shoes fitted or those who were using it more often, but they created almost certainty that a shoe salesperson over time would have doses likely to give them cancer and some other problems. Isn't that true? You are right. The, the, the biggest doses were to the, uh, the salespersons rather than the individuals getting the, uh, the, the, the uh, foot examination. So clearly these products, although they may be less than the fluoroscopes of old, they are showing about the same thing. They are designed to show about the same thing. They, in fact, represent a high likelihood that our 57,000 TSA individuals who are not badged to see if they are getting excess dosage are getting dosage far higher than the rest of us would, even as frequent travelers. 
Well, I'm not sure I know the answer to your question as to whether it's really a high likelihood. Because but they're getting higher dosage. Almost certainly so, but I think we need to measure those doses. Well, and that's one of the points I think this committee has an obligation to do, is to see that, that the measurement begins immediately, even if these things are not going to be stopped. Let me, uh, let me go through one more item. I was, a, a, like uh, uh, Mr. Farenhold, I was a clear passenger. I gave them my retina scan. I gave them all my fingerprints. And I was dismayed when I found out that they thought they were going to sell their asset that, in fact, I would paid to give them. Uh, which is what made me a little, a little worried about things more than I had been in this cyber era. But let me just ask the simple question, and including you, Mr. Baker, since you think that everything helps a little, false ID is easy to get. People get it every day, and they come to this country in vast amounts over the Mexican border a few miles from my district. The IDs that will let you come through the country illegally are the same IDs that TSA looks at with you know, some, some level of does a picture match. Anyone can print out a boarding pass. Anyone can take a boarding pass and effectively make a new boarding pass once you have a few of them. From a standpoint of the actual, is the person who they say they are and are they actually on the flight that they say they are on, isn't one of the gaping flaws right now that when you go through security anywhere in America, they don't actually know for sure that you are who you say you are because the ID is questionable, and they don't even know that the ticket you have is valid for the flight you are on. Haven't we left gaping holes that should be filled first at a fraction of the cost of what we are looking at here today? I had just quick answers from anyone that wants to partake, uh, particularly you, Mr. Baker. It, it, I, it, yes, for sure, bad ID is a problem. Uh, TSA has done a much better job than the airlines did of checking those IDs. That is why they have the loops. That is why have, they have the fluorescent lights. Uh, uh, they are checking ID and they are finding fake ID much more than w was the case uh, prior to TSA taking over that response. Yes, I remember they claimed that my, my government ID as a congressman was fake and they wanted to see backup California driver's license, which anybody can get, even if they are not a citizen. The, 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 the Mr. Problem, Chairman, Mr. thank you for your indulgence. Uh, I yield back. Thanks. The gentleman yields back. Uh, with the Chairman's indulgence uh, or privilege here, I recognize myself and then Mr. Tierney here as we, as we wrap up this panel. And again, do appreciate all of your, your participation. Um, Mr. Baker, <clears throat> would you agree or disagree that layered security is really the only way to move forward? There is no foolproof solution. Absolutely. My concern is that these whole body imaging machines, as they have been deployed, do give us a false sense of security and, in fact, are in part security theater, as I call it, uh, that don't necessarily give the degree of confidence that I would like in securing that airplane. There are, your, your concern is but just by going through the metal detector, there are things that go undetected. But conversely, aren't there things that go through a whole body imaging machine that go undetected? Absolutely. None of this technology is perfect. It is just that these body imagers are much more effective at finding the kinds of weapons we are worried about than magnetometers. So I, I guess, I guess than, than are you familiar there. with the Government Accountability Office who um, issued an unclassified report in March of 2010 that said, quote, it remains unclear whether the AIT would have detected the weapon used in the December 2009 incident, end quote. I am aware of that, and I understand the, the argument that they are making. Uh, it remains unclear to al-Qaeda as well, I, I would point out. Uh, the, the important thing to say here is, since there is no perfect solution, we have to find a solution that is better than what we have, and we don't have something better than these machines today. And, and while you mock the idea of using a dog, because you have an overly aggressive schnauzer or something. No, no, I think it is a great idea. I, I don't mean to mock it. It, it is a great idea. It is just that it doesn't Would you agree hate. or disagree with the Pentagon who says that this is a more effective way than the current AIT? In fact, do we have up the slide here? I just returned from Afghanistan two, three weeks ago. Um, if we could pull up that slide. How many uh, whole body imaging machines do you think we have deployed to Afghanistan? I have no idea. Yeah. How many have we deployed to Iraq or Pakistan, where we have literally over 100,000 of our men and women in harm's way, where we have to deal with the threat on a daily basis? What I am looking at is people who are really, truly concerned about what is going on 
in the green zones. They are dealing with these improvised explosive devices, which come at them in every way, shape, or form. We are not deploying whole body imaging machines. We are deploying dogs. And to suggest that they only work for 20 minutes, I believe, is wholly inaccurate. I think the TSA is failing us because they are so insistent on technology. Technology for technology's sake doesn't work. It, technology is great, but if it doesn't work, it is not so good. And what I worry about, as the gentleman from Massachusetts pointed out, in, in going to a, to a Gumby-like type of thing, what if the technology is not working? So again, I wish there was a foolproof solution. I wish we didn't have to deal with the reality of the threat that there is truly uh, terrorists that want to kill our people and blow things up. I worry, though, that the TSA is maybe a little too anxious to deploy technology, even though we know from a, from a, a parallel experience in Afghanistan and Pakistan and whatnot, they are so quick to deploy technology at an enormous cost, an invasion of privacy, when there are things out there that will make us more secure. I show you this picture because, again, three weeks ago, they weren't importing whole body imaging machines. They had dogs. We have the State of the Union here, one of the most highly secure events out there. They bring in the dogs. That is the point I guess I would like to make. And I worry that you know, we deployed, spent $30 million bringing in puffers with the suggestion that, uh, that they would work, and then only to find out that they really didn't work. The last point, and, and Mr. Baker, I, I appreciate all of you being here. There was one part of your testimony that did trouble me. It was this part that you found that, uh, and this is a quote from your testimony, critics are making a privacy mountain out of a molehill, end quote. You also have said that privacy concerns are, quote, counterproductive. And in this day and age where we are trying to balance the Fourth Amendment, the right of Americans to be secure, how do you, how do you justify saying that the privacy concerns are counterproductive? We heard thing, a testimony from Representative Cisna here to say that critics are making a, a privacy mountain out of a molehill. Absolutely, because if we had listened to the privacy advocates, we would have no machines deployed. We would have no protection against the kind of bombs that were used on December 25th other than magnetometers that do not work. That is the result of privacy lobbying, and I think it is counterproductive. Well, I, for one, wholeheartedly disagree with you. I think that a lot of people have offered uh, a reasonable use of certain machines in certain instances. I, for one, believe that as a secondary screening device, um, that the whole body imaging machine does have a certain place. Somebody has a hip replacement, a knee replacement. Um, I think that is a, a, a productive use of those. I guess the, the, the question or the, the encouragement I would have moving forward is to try to find the balances between the Fourth Amendment that we have, increasing the security of the airport, lessening the evasiveness. That is, I think, what we should all be striving for. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Ranking Member, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank our witnesses again. Interesting idea in this. I, I don't know if anybody on the panel has the technical expertise that warrants this as a fair question of them, but I think, Mr. Baker, you may have as, either have it or be as close as anybody on this. Would the AIT detect or would have it detected uh, a powder or a liquid uh, explosive? My understanding is that it can, it can detect uh, unusual bulks and volumes and different textures uh, that don't match the body uh, or that uh, are not, you know, uh, don't fit the body profile. Um, but to some extent, there is an amount of judgment in that. And one of the things I worry about with these Gumby uh, figures is the judgment is going to be made by the machine, and we have to be sure that they can do that right. So at any rate, it wouldn't identify it as a powdered explosive or a liquid disclosure, just something that isn't normally on a body. We have to explore could, further. Could I speak to that, Mr. Tierney? Sure, if you have the expertise. Sure. Well, we have had the time to review the procurement specifications. And the question that you ask is actually on page um, 10 of my uh, testimony. It is the key excerpt. And I can tell you, looking through the documents, that the problem, the threat assessment when the TSA began the AIT, was um, plastic knives, uh, ceramic guns, uh, plastic, C4, dense nonmetallic images. That is what these devices are designed to detect. 
Okay. And you see the problem of PETN, which is the powder that was used by the trouser bomber mm -hmm. uh, and the shoe bomber, the devices were not designed uh, to detect. So when you look at the research that came out post December 25th, the GAO report and the academic studies, I mean, they are largely inconclusive, but they are inconclusive as to the fact that the powder would not have been located. Thank and that is in the procurement design. Thank you. you know, Mr. Baker, I, uh, I heard you say, uh, make a comment about the, the millimeter wave versus the X-ray backscatter on that. Uh, in assuming, because I haven't heard contrary here, that both of them are equally as effective in detecting whatever it is they are detecting, uh, the millimeter wave um, doesn't raise any, apparently doesn't raise any evidence that there be a uh, health, public health safety problem here. But we buy both of them, am I to say, on your testimony, because going to one uh, supplier would keep the cost lower, so we may use one that has a public safety question and one that doesn't uh, as a cost effectiveness measure as opposed to any other reason to have both of them? I, I, as I said, there, there, is a, there will be a cost to going to a single sole supplier for something as, as, as significant as this purchase. So we have I, to decide I, whether or not I, that cost outweighs the risk it, of absolutely. one of them having that. Absolutely. I think okay. that the, the, the TSA view has been that they think that all the studies suggest the risk is yeah. close. So we should explore that, I think, a little. And then, finally, not to be contentious, Mr. Chairman, but just to, I think, raise the point that, uh, that, again, we should go back to having some sort of framework for evaluating the effectiveness, effectiveness and privacy on everything. I, I know two things. One is there are 300 AIT machines currently deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's not like they are just dogs uh, over there. They have been used for the past six years. Uh, and I just quote from an article that appeared on March 1st of 2003. Uh, that examined the possibility of replacing bomb-sniffing dogs with handheld chemical systems. Among the drawbacks of using dogs, the article stated, is that they require rigorous training, testing and validation exercises in various operational scenarios and with different types of explosives. The animal's performance, which requires constant retraining, frequently declines over time and after extensive field work. According to the article, the dogs became tired after 30 to 120 minutes, which means using more than one dog at each location. Dogs also exhibit behavioral variations and changing moves which might affect performance. In addition, dogs often trigger false alarms because they are trained to detect chemicals which may appear in other forms uh, than just explosives. And finally, terrorists also may turn to certain stable explosives that emit very little chemi chemical vapor and are therefore harder for jobs to detect. So why I wouldn't totally exclude dogs and from the equation in a layered system or whatever, I think they ought to be put through the same evaluation uh, process for effectiveness and for privacy indications on that. As we move forward, we will, uh, I assume, try to do that. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. Are there any other members uh, seeking to ask questions of this panel? With that, we will thank the uh, panel members for their participation, your efforts, your time uh, in preparation of this testimony. Um, if, uh, I would allow also for five uh, legislative days for members to uh, submit. Uh, other information. We would also ask and, and hope that you would cooperate. If members have additional questions, that they be able to submit those to you. If you can provide those answers back to us, we will make sure that the other members of the committee have that. We thank you for your expertise, uh, for your insight into this, and thank you for your time and effort to be here today. Uh, the second panel is adjourned. We had talked about, uh, as they uh, dismiss here, we would need some time to set up the third panel. Uh, but I have also come to learn that this committee room has been uh, scheduled and has been committed to uh, that needs a set up and whatnot from 1.15 on. Uh, consequently, it is going to be this uh, Chairman's prerogative to delay what was supposed to be two gentlemen from the TSA that were going to be here as part of the second panel, insisting that they have to have their own separate hearing and they can't be sitting next to somebody that they disagree with. Um, that we are going to delay that third panel and we will reschedule it. We are hoping to do that the first week of April. Mr. Uh, Chairman, may, may I be heard on this? Sure. Mr. Chairman, I don't understand this at all. Uh, first of all, we have this whole discussion. Mm -hmm. We resolved the issue. We have asked the TSA to come over here today. They are here, so they came across to accommodate the Chairman and the rest of this committee. Having them on this panel now or putting them on separately now is not going to be a time factor at all. It will take about a minute and a half to put up new uh, name tags. And then we would have 45 minutes minimally to have this hearing, which would have only extended this current panel 45 minutes. I don't think there is any real rationale for that. I am a little upset that we went through the whole process of trying to be cooperative. TSA did come downtown. It would be effective to have them testify at this hearing. Uh, I just think it is totally inappropriate, and I don't think your reasoning is sound enough 
to give us a, a real true matter of, of why it is you won't let them proceed. I ask that the, that the Chairman reconsider, that he allow them to come out right now. They will have 45 minutes. If you want to bring them back again, if you feel that it hasn't given you a satisfactory opportunity to question them, I will agree to that and we will work that out for another term. But to send them away after having gone through that whole process this morning, bringing the Chairman and the Ranking Member of the full committee in, discussing it out, having an agreement, inviting them down here, and then sending them away, I just think is, uh, is totally inappropriate and disrespectful, frankly. Well, I think uh, I appreciate the gentleman's comments. I appreciate the working nature that our staff and, and the members have here together. Nevertheless, uh, I do believe that this is of keen interest to uh, most every member that is on this committee. I want to allow adequate time to hear their testimony and allow members to question them. We are also, under committee rules, allowed to have multiple rounds of questioning. Uh, we certainly have uh, right now just a handful of members here without any sort of notice uh, that would give them adequate time. We have run over by a good 15 minutes, uh, longer from the time that we thought we would start the third panel. In deference to those uh, members who do want to participate on this panel and ask questions, given the late nature of which this second panel uh, was there, and given the fact that they had notice, we had planned on, they had committed to being here, uh, for this panel number two, they certainly had adequate time to do that. I don't Mr. want to Chairman, jump around anybody's. Rather than relitigate the that issue, we had will suspend. That the gentleman will litigated. suspend. The gentleman will suspend. Well, you know, I have a we, difficult time the suspending. Gentleman if you are not suspend. going to follow the rules and uh, the he to our agreement, will suspend. then I am not sure why I should agree we did, to this. We did not aspect. No, the gentleman will suspend. The agreement was that they were going to come here and participate on the second panel. Now, they refused to do so, and they came to that election on their, by themselves. Was the Chairman not we, present this morning the gentleman when the agreement will suspend. was made that they would come and I will testify? be happy to yield. I will be happy to will yield. Will the Chairman yield? I, no, not until I, I finish not making that happy. It, I'm not very happy. Until we finish my concluding, uh, until I make these comments. We had anticipated that this panel would reconvene for panel number three at 12.15. It is past 12.15. It is, in fact, well past 1215. The other thing that has come to light is we have another committee that has done research and work and preparation, and members have adjusted their schedules in order to accommodate that hearing, which is going to start, which would be less than an hour from now. Consequently, I want to do this the right way. I want to do it the right way for the TSA. I want to do it the right way for every member on this panel. So we have adequate time to get to the issues that need to be get at. So with that, I am suggesting, in fact, I am ruling that we are going to move this third panel to the next, to another date. Chairman, you said you would yield. Will you yield? I am sorry. You said you would yield. Will you yes, yield? Yes, please. All right. Rather than keep this going on so that you actually make it a reality that there is not enough time, let me just say one more time that there is 45 minutes. You don't know that the panel was going to go an hour with these people anyway. 45 minutes could be entirely adequate. Let's get them started. Let's get them out here. If you want to bring them back at some other point in time, you can do that. You have essentially all of the members that you had earlier here, and they were all made aware that we had come to some agreement this morning that TSA would come on at the last panel. This is no surprise to anybody. Everybody had their testimony from last night. Uh, I just find your whole reasoning behind this totally lame and inappropriate, and I am not pleased at all uh, with having come to an agreement this morning on that and have you come up with a rather lame excuse to put that agreement aside. I would ask you to, one last time to reconsider and let's do this the right way and keep our working relationship as we have had it on this as a wholly cooperative idea, one that we can rely on each other's word. Would the gentleman yield? Mr. Yes. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I know we may not complete this. I have been assured that the, uh, the next subcommittee could move a little bit to give us a little additional time. I have also been assured we won't have votes before 1.15 to 1.30. My concern, which I share with the Chairman, is that uh, we will need to ask the TSA to be willing to come back if we do not conclude by the time of the vote. If that can be agreed to, I, I would join with the other gentlemen to try to start, but we would need that agreement from the my TSA. Time. I would in no way impede that and would support that effort to have them back if that is appropriate and, and we need more time to finish. On a point of order. Does any other member wish to? Yeah. Yes. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Chairman, not to eat up more of our valuable, valuable time, but uh, we have them here. And, and I just want to point out that, you know, your, your hearing, our hearing, was uh, 
a conflict with a lot of other hearings when we originally scheduled it. That is why members are, are, are back and forth. And there is no guarantee that that won't happen again when we, we reschedule it. It is just the way things work here. I, I do like the, uh, the comprehensive aspect of this where you had a bunch of good panels in here, and, and uh, I would like to hear from the TSA. I just hate to wa waste time. We have got, we've got 45 minutes. We could go at these folks. And I, I, I have some questions I would like to ask of them, as, as I am sure you are. And uh, if we have to bring them back, we will bring them back. I yield back. Does any other member wish to speak to this? This committee will stand in recess for five minutes while we redress, and uh, we will make a ruling at that time. Thank you.